George Washington, February 22, 1732 to December 14, 1799, was the first president of the United States, 1789 to 1797, and led the Continental Army to victory over the Kingdom of Great Britain in the American Revolutionary War, 1775 to 1783. Washington was chosen to be the commander-in-chief of the American Revolutionary Forces in 1775. The following year, he forced the British out of Boston, lost New York City, and crossed the Delaware River in New Jersey and defeated the surprised enemy units later that year. As a result of his strategy, revolutionary forces captured the two main British combat armies, Saratoga and Yorktown. Negotiating with Congress, the colonial states, and French allies, he held together a tenuous army and a fragile nation amid the threats of disintegration and failure. Following the end of the war in 1783, Washington retired to his plantation on Mount Vernon. Unsatisfied with the Articles of Confederation, he presided over the Philadelphia Convention that drafted the United States Constitution in 1787. Washington became President of the United States in 1789 and established many of the customs and usages of the new government's executive department. He sought to create a great nation, capable of surviving in a world torn asunder by war between Britain and France. His unilateral proclamation of neutrality of 1793 provided a basis for avoiding any involvement in foreign conflicts. He supported plans to build a strong central government by funding the national debt, implementing an effective tax system, and creating a national bank. Washington avoided the temptation of war and began a decade of peace with Britain via the Jay Treaty in 1795. He used his prestige to get it ratified over intense opposition from the Jeffersonians. Although never officially joining the Federalist Party, he supported its programs and was its inspirational leader. Washington's farewell address was a primer on Republican virtue and a stern warning against involvement in foreign wars. Washington is seen as a symbol of the United States and republicanism in practice. His devotion to civic virtue made him an exemplary figure among the early American politicians. Washington died in 1799, and in his funeral oration, Henry Lee said that of all Americans, he was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Washington has been consistently ranked by scholars as one of the greatest U.S. presidents. Early Life George Washington was born on February 22, 1732, the first son of Augustine Washington and his second wife, Mary Ball Washington, on the family's Pope's Creek estate near present-day Colonial Beach in Westmoreland County, Virginia. He was educated in the home by his father and older brother. In his youth, Washington worked as a surveyor and acquired what would become invaluable knowledge of the terrain around his native state of Virginia. Washington embarked upon a career as a planter and in 1748 was invited to help survey Baron Fairfax's lands west of the Blue Ridge. In 1749, he was appointed to his first public office, surveyor of newly created Culpeper County and through his half-brother Lawrence Washington, he became interested in the Ohio Company, which aimed to exploit western lands. In 1751, George and his half-brother traveled to Barbados, staying at Bush Hill House, hoping for an improvement in Lawrence's tuberculosis. This was the only time George Washington traveled outside what is now the United States. After Lawrence's death in 1752, George inherited part of his estate and took over some of Lawrence's duties as adjutant of the colony. Washington was appointed a district adjutant general in the Virginia militia in 1752, which made him Major Washington at the age of 20. He was charged with training the militia in the quarter assigned him. At age 21, in Fredericksburg, Washington became a master mason in the organization of Freemasons, a fraternal organization that was a lifelong influence. In December 1753, Washington was detailed by Governor Robert Dinwiddie of Virginia to carry a British ultimatum to the French on the Ohio frontier. Washington assessed French military strength and intentions and delivered the message to the French at Fort Leboeuf in present-day Waterford, Pennsylvania.
The message, which went unheeded, called for the French to abandon their development of the Ohio country, setting in motion two colonial powers toward worldwide conflict. Washington's report on the affair was widely read on both sides of the Atlantic. French and Indian War, Seven Years' War in 1754, Dinwiddie commissioned Washington a lieutenant colonel and ordered him to lead an expedition to Fort Duquesne to drive out the French. With his American Indian allies led by Tana Harrison, Washington led his troops ambushed by a French scouting party of some 30 men, led by Joseph Coulon de Jumonville. Washington and his troops were overwhelmed at Fort Necessity by a larger and better positioned French and Indian force. The terms of the surrender included a statement that Washington had assassinated the scouts and their leader at the Battle of Jumonville Glen. Released by the French, Washington returned to Virginia, where he resigned rather than accept demotion. In 1755, Washington was an aide to British General Edward Braddock on the ill-fated Monongahela expedition. This was a major effort to retake the Ohio country. While Braddock was killed and the expedition ended in disaster, Washington distinguished himself as the hero of the Monongahela. While Washington's role during the battle has been debated, biographer Joseph Ellis asserts that Washington rode back and forth across the battlefield, rallying the remnant of the British and Virginian forces to a retreat. Subsequent to this action, Washington was given a difficult frontier command in the Virginia mountains, and was rewarded by being promoted to colonel and named commander of all Virginian forces. In 1758, Washington participated as a brigadier general in the Forbes expedition that prompted French evacuation of Fort Duquesne and the British establishment of Pittsburgh. Later that year, Washington resigned from active military service and spent the next 16 years as a Virginia planter and politician. Between the Wars George Washington was introduced to Martha Dandridge Custis, a widow who was living at the White House Plantation on the south shore of the Pamunkey River in New Kent County, Virginia, by friends of Martha when George was on leave from the French and Indian War. George only visited her home twice before proposing marriage to her three weeks after they met. George and Martha were each 27 years old when they married on January 6, 1759 at her home known as the White House, which shared its name with the future presidential mansion. The newlywed couple moved to Mount Vernon, where he took up the Tuckahoe life of a genteel planter and political figure. They had a good marriage, and together they raised her two children by her previous marriage to Daniel Park Custis, John Park Custis, and and Martha Park Custis, affectionately called Jackie and Patsy. George and Martha never had any children together. An earlier bout with smallpox followed by tuberculosis may have left him sterile. Later, the Washingtons raised two of Mrs. Washington's grandchildren, Eleanor Park Custis, Nellie, and George Washington Park Custis, Washi, after their father died in 1781. Washington's marriage to a wealthy widow greatly increased his property holdings and social standing. He acquired one-third of the 18,000-acre Custis estates upon his marriage and managed the remainder on behalf of Martha's children. He frequently purchased additional land in his own name and was granted land in what is now West Virginia as a bounty for his service in the French and Indian War. By 1775, Washington had doubled the size of Mount Vernon to 6,500 acres, with over 100 slaves. As a respected military hero and large landowner, he held local office and was elected to the Virginia Provincial Legislature, the House of Burgesses, beginning in 1758. And he served as a justice of Fairfax and held court in Alexandria, Virginia, between 1760 and 1774. Washington first took a leading role in the growing colonial resistance in 1769 when he introduced a proposal drafted by his friend George Mason, which called for Virginia to boycott imported English goods until the Townsend Acts were repealed. Parliament repealed the Acts in 1770. Washington also took an active interest in helping his fellow citizens. On September 21, 1771, Washington wrote a letter to Neil Jameson on behalf of Jonathan Plowman, Jr., a merchant from Baltimore whose ship had been seized for exporting non-permitted items by the Boston frigate, and requested his help toward recovery of Plowman's ship. 
Washington regarded the passage of the Intolerable Acts in 1774 as, quote, an invasion of our rights and privileges, end of quote. In July 1774, he chaired the meeting at which the Fairfax Resolves were adopted, which called for, among other things, the convening of a Continental Congress. In August, he attended the First Virginia Convention, where he was selected as a delegate to the First Continental Congress. American Revolution after fighting broke out in April 1775, Washington appeared at the Second Continental Congress in military uniform, signaling that he was prepared for war. Washington had the prestige, the military experience, the charisma and military bearing, the reputation of being a strong patriot, and he was supported by the South, especially Virginia. Although he did not explicitly seek the office of commander and even claimed he was not equal to it, there was no serious competition. Congress created the Continental Army on June 14, 1775. The next day, on the nomination of John Adams of Massachusetts, Washington was appointed Major General and elected by Congress to be Commander-in-Chief. Washington assumed command of the Continental Army in the field at Cambridge, Massachusetts in July 1775, during the ongoing siege of Boston. Realizing his army's desperate shortage of gunpowder, Washington asked for new sources. British arsenals were raided, including some in the Caribbean, and some manufacturing was attempted. A barely adequate supply, about 2.5 million pounds, was obtained by the end of 1776, mostly from France. Washington reorganized the army during the long standoff and forced the British to withdraw by putting artillery on Dorchester Heights overlooking the city. The British evacuated Boston and Washington moved his army to New York City. Although negative toward the Patriots in the Continental Congress, British newspapers routinely praised Washington's personal character and qualities as a military commander. Moreover, both sides of the aisle in Parliament found the American general's courage, endurance, and attentiveness to the welfare of his troops worthy of approbation, and examples of the virtues they and most other Britons found wanting in their own commanders. Washington's refusal to become involved in politics buttressed his reputation as a man fully committed to the military mission at hand and above the factional fray. In August 1776, British General William Howe launched a massive naval and land campaign designed to seize New York and offer a negotiated settlement. The Continental Army under Washington engaged the enemy for the first time as the army of the newly declared independent United States at the Battle of Long Island, the largest battle of the entire war. This and several other British victories sent Washington scrambling out of New York and across New Jersey, leaving the future of the Continental Army in doubt. On the night of December 25, 1776, Washington staged a counterattack, leading the American forces across the Delaware River to capture nearly 1,000 Hessians in Trenton, New Jersey. Washington was defeated at the Battle of Brandywine on September 11, 1777. On September 26, Howe outmaneuvered Washington and marched into Philadelphia unopposed. Washington's army unsuccessfully attacked the British garrison at Germantown in early October. Meanwhile, Burgoyne, out of reach from help from Howe, was trapped and forced to surrender his entire army at Saratoga, New York. As a result of this battle, France entered the war as an open ally of the Americans, turning the revolution into a major worldwide war. Washington's loss of Philadelphia prompted some members of Congress to discuss removing Washington from command. This episode failed after Washington's supporters rallied behind him. Washington's army encamped at Valley Forge in December 1777, where it stayed for the next six months. Over the winter, 2,500 men out of 10,000 died from disease and exposure. The next spring, however, the army emerged from Valley Forge in good order, thanks in part to a full-scale training program supervised by Baron von Steuben, a veteran of the Prussian general staff. 
The British evacuated Philadelphia in 1778 and returned to New York City. Meanwhile, Washington remained with his army outside New York, and in the summer of 1779, at Washington's direction, General John Sullivan, in retaliation for Iroquois and Tory attacks against American settlements earlier in the war, carried out a decisive scorched earth campaign that destroyed at least 40 Iroquois villages throughout what is now upstate New York. He delivered the final blow in 1781, after a French naval victory allowed American and French forces to trap a British army in Virginia. The surrender at Yorktown on October 17, 1781, marked the end of fighting. Though known for his successes in the war and his life that followed, Washington only won three of the nine battles that he fought. In March 1783, Washington used his influence to disperse a group of army officers who had threatened to confront Congress regarding their back pay. The Treaty of Paris, signed that September, recognized the independence of the United States. Washington disbanded his army and on November 2nd gave an eloquent farewell address to his soldiers. On November 25th, the British evacuated New York City and Washington and the governor took possession. At France's tavern on December 4th, Washington formally bade his officers farewell, and on December 23, 1783, he resigned his commission as commander-in-chief, emulating the Roman general Cincinnatus, an exemplar of the republican ideal of citizen leadership who rejected power. During this period, the United States was governed under the Articles of Confederation without a president. Governmental organization was different from the present form. Washington's retirement to Mount Vernon was short-lived. He made an exploratory trip to the western frontier in 1784, was persuaded to attend the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787, and was unanimously elected president of the convention. He participated little in the debates involved, though he did vote for or against the various articles, but his high prestige maintained collegiality and kept the delegates at their labors. The delegates designed the presidency with Washington in mind and allowed him to define the office once elected. After the convention, his support convinced many, including the Virginia legislature, to vote for ratification. The new Constitution was ratified by all 13 states. Presidency, 1789-1797 The Electoral College elected Washington unanimously in 1789 and again in the 1792 election. He remains the only president to receive 100% of the electoral votes. John Adams was elected vice president. Washington took the oath of office as the first president under the Constitution for the United States of America April 30, 1789 at Federal Hall, New York City, although at first he had not wanted the position. The first United States Congress voted to pay Washington a salary of $25,000 a year, a large sum in 1789. Washington, already wealthy, declined the salary since he valued his image as a selfless public servant. At the urging of Congress, however, he ultimately ultimately accepted the payment. A dangerous precedent could have been set otherwise, as the Founding Fathers wanted future presidents to come from a large pool of potential candidates, not just those citizens who could afford to do the work for free. Washington attended carefully to the pomp and ceremony of office, making sure that the titles and trappings were suitably Republican and never emulated European royal courts. To that end, he preferred the title Mr. President to the more majestic name suggested. Washington proved an able administrator, an excellent delegator and judge of talent and character. He held regular cabinet meetings to debate issues before making a final decision. In handling routine tasks, he was systematic, orderly, energetic, solicitous of the opinion of others, but decisive, intent upon general goals and the consistency of particular actions with them. Washington reluctantly served a second term as president. He refused to run for a third, establishing the customary policy of a maximum of two terms for president, which later became law by the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution. Domestic Issues 
Washington was not a member of any political party and hoped that they would not be formed out of fear of the conflict and stagnation they could cause governance. His closest advisors, however, formed two factions, setting the framework for the future first party system. Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton had bold plans to establish the national credit and build a financially powerful nation and form the basis of the Federalist Party. Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, founder of the Jeffersonian Republicans, strenuously opposed Hamilton's agenda, but Washington favored Hamilton over Jefferson. In 1791, Congress imposed an excise on distilled spirits, which led to protests in frontier districts, especially Pennsylvania. By 1794, Washington ordered the protesters to appear in U.S. District Court. The protests turned into full-scale riots known as the Whiskey Rebellion. The Federal Army was too small to be used, so Washington invoked the Militia Act of 1792 to summon the militias of Pennsylvania, Virginia, and several other states. The governor sent the troops, and Washington took command, marching into the rebellious districts. There was no fighting, but Washington's forceful action proved the new government could protect itself. It also was one of only two times that a sitting president would personally command the military in the field. These events marked the first time under the new constitution that the federal government used strong military force to exert authority over the states and citizens. Foreign Affairs in 1793, the revolutionary government of France and diplomat Edmund Charles Genet called Citizen Genet to America. Genet issued letters of mark and reprisal to American ships so they could capture British merchant ships. He attempted to turn popular sentiment toward American involvement in the French war against Britain by creating a network of democratic-republican societies in major cities. Washington rejected this interference in domestic affairs, demanded the French government recall Genet, and denounced his societies. To normalize trade relations with Britain, remove them from western forts, and resolve financial debts left over from the Revolution, Hamilton and Washington designed the Jay Treaty. It was negotiated by John Jay and signed on November 19, 1794. The Jeffersonians supported France and strongly attacked the treaty. Washington and Hamilton, however, mobilized public opinion and won ratification by the Senate by emphasizing Washington support. The British agreed to depart their forts around the Great Lakes. The Canadian-U.S. boundary was adjusted, numerous pre-revolutionary debts were liquidated, and the British opened their West Indies colonies to American trade. Most importantly, the treaty avoided war with Britain and instead brought a decade of prosperous trade with Britain. It angered the French and became a central issue in political debates. Supreme Court Appointments George Washington appointed 12 justices to the Supreme Court during his presidency. Washington's farewell address, issued as a public letter in 1796, was one of the most influential statements of American political values. Drafted primarily by Washington himself, with help from Hamilton, it gives advice on the necessity and importance of national union the value of the Constitution and the rule of law, the evils of political parties, and the proper virtues of a Republican people. In the address he called morality a necessary spring of popular government. He said, Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle making the point that the value of religion is for the benefit of society as a whole. Washington's public political address warned against foreign influence in domestic affairs and American meddling in European affairs. He warned against bitter partisanship in domestic politics and called for men to move beyond partisanship and serve the common good. He called for an America wholly free of foreign attachments, saying the United States must concentrate primarily on American interests. 
He counseled friendship and commerce with all nations, but warned against involvement in European wars and entering into long-term entangling alliances. The address quickly set American values regarding religion and foreign affairs. Washington's farewell address issued as a public letter in 1796 was one of the most influential statements of American political values. Drafted primarily by Washington himself, with help from Hamilton, it gives advice on the necessity and importance of national union, the value of the Constitution and the rule of law, the evils of political parties, and the proper virtues of a Republican people. In the address, he called morality a necessary spring of popular government. He said, reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle, making the point that the value of religion is for the benefit of society as a whole. Washington's public political address warned against foreign influence in domestic affairs and American meddling in European affairs. He warned against bitter partisanship in domestic politics and called for men to move beyond partisanship and serve the common good. He called for an America wholly free of foreign attachments, saying the United States must concentrate primarily on American interests. He counseled friendship and commerce with all nations, but warned against involvement in European wars and entering into long-term entangling alliances. The address quickly set American values regarding religion and foreign affairs. Retirement and Death After retiring from the presidency in March 1797, Washington returned to Mount Vernon with a profound sense of relief. He devoted much time to farming and in that year constructed a 2,250-square-foot distillery, which was one of the largest in the New Republic, housing five copper stills, a boiler, and 50 mash tubs at the site of one of his unprofitable farms. At its peak two years later, the distillery produced 11,000 gallons of corn and rye whiskey worth $7,500, and it produced fruit brandy. On July 13, 1798, Washington was appointed by President John Adams to be Lieutenant General and Commander-in-Chief of all armies raised or to be raised for service in a prospective war with France. He served as the senior officer of the United States Army between July 13, 1798 and December 14, 1799. He participated in the planning for a provisional army to meet any emergency that might arise but did not take the field. On December 12, 1799, Washington spent several hours inspecting his farms on horseback, in snow and later hail in freezing rain. He sat down to dine that evening without changing his wet clothes. The next morning, he awoke with a bad cold, fever, and a throat infection called quinsy that turned into acute laryngitis and pneumonia. Washington died on the evening of December 14, 1799, at his home, age 67, while attended by Dr. James Craik, one of his closest friends, and Thomas Lear V, Washington's personal secretary. Lear would record the account in his journal, writing that Washington's last words were, "'Tis well." Modern doctors believe that Washington died largely because of his treatment, which included calomel and bloodletting, resulting in a combination of shock from the loss of five pints of blood, as well as asphyxia and dehydration. Washington's remains were buried at Mount Vernon. To protect their privacy, Martha Washington burned the correspondence between her husband and herself following his death. Only three letters between the couple have survived. During the United States Bicentennial year, George Washington was posthumously appointed to the grade of General of the Armies of the United States by the Congressional Joint Resolution Public Law 94-479 of January 19, 1976, approved by President Gerald R. Ford on October 11, 1976, and formalized in the Department of the Army Order No. 31-3 of March 13, 1978, with an effective appointment date of July 4, 1978. This restored Washington's position as the highest-ranking military officer in U.S. history, which had been undone when General John J. Pershing was made General of the Armies at the end of World War I. Legacy Congressman Henry Lee, a Revolutionary War comrade and father of Civil War General Robert E. Lee, famously eulogized Washington as, First in war, 
first in peace and first in the hearts of his countrymen. He was second to none in humble and enduring scenes of private life, pious, just, humane, temperate, and sincere, uniform, dignified, and commanding. His example was as edifying to all around him as were the effects of that example lasting. Correct throughout, vice shuddered in his presence, and virtue always felt his fostering hand. The purity of his private character gave effulgence to his public virtues. Such was the man for whom our nation mourns. Lee's words set the standard by which Washington's overwhelming reputation was impressed upon the American memory. Washington set many precedents for the national government and the presidency in particular. As early as 1778, Washington was lauded as the father of his country. He was upheld as a shining example in school books and lessons, as courageous and far-sighted, holding the Continental Army together through eight hard years of war and numerous privations, sometimes by sheer force of will, and as restrained, at war's end, taking affront at the notion he should be king, and after two terms as president, stepping aside. Washington manifested himself as an exemplar of Republican virtue in America. More than any other American, he was extolled for his great personal integrity and a deeply held sense of duty, honor, and patriotism. He seen more as a character model than war hero or founding father. One of Washington's greatest achievements in terms of Republican values was refraining from taking more power than was due. He was conscientious of maintaining a good reputation by avoiding political intrigue. He rejected nepotism or cronyism. Jefferson observed, The moderation and virtue of a single character probably prevented this revolution from being closed, as most others have been, by a subversion of that liberty it was intended to establish. Monuments and Memorials Washington is commemorated on the quarter, Washington is also commemorated on the dollar coin. Today, Washington's face and image are often used as national symbols of the United States, along with the icons such as the flag and great seal. Perhaps the most prominent commemoration of his legacy is the use of his image on the one dollar bill and the quarter dollar coin. Washington, together with Theodore Roosevelt, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln, is depicted in stone at the Mount Rushmore Memorial. The Washington Monument, one of the most well-known American landmarks, was built in his honor. The George Washington Masonic National Memorial in Alexandria, Virginia, constructed entirely with voluntary contributions from members of the Masonic fraternity, was also built in his honor. Many things have been named in honor of Washington. Washington's name became that of the nation's capital, Washington, D.C and the state of Washington, the only state to be named after an American. Maryland, the Virginias, the Carolinas, and Georgia are named in honor of British monarchs. George Washington University and Washington University in St. Louis were named for him, as was Washington and Lee University, once Washington Academy, which was renamed due to Washington's large endowment in 1796. The Confederate seal predominantly featured George Washington on horseback in the same position as a statue of him in Richmond, Virginia. Washington and Slavery George Washington grew hemp as a crop on his plantation. For most of his life, Washington operated his plantations as a typical Virginia slave owner. In the 1760s, he dropped tobacco, which was prestigious but unprofitable, and shifted to hemp and wheat, growing and diversified into milling flour, weaving cloth, and distilling brandy. By the time of his death, there were 317 slaves at Mount Vernon. Before the American Revolution, Washington expressed no moral reservations about slavery. But by 1778, he had stopped selling slaves without their consent, because he didn't want to break up slave families. In 1778, while Washington was at war, he wrote to his manager at Mount Vernon that he wished to sell his slaves and to get quit of Negroes, since maintaining a large and increasingly elderly slave population was not economically profitable. Washington could not legally sell dower slaves, those that belonged to his wife, however, 
and because these slaves had long intermarried with his own slaves, he could not sell his slaves without breaking up families. Washington was the only prominent slave-holding founding father who succeeded at emancipating his slaves. He did not free his slaves in his lifetime, however, but instead included a provision in his will to free his slaves upon the death of his wife. Not all the slaves at his estate at Mount Vernon were owned by him. His wife Martha owned a large number of slaves, and Washington didn't feel he could unilaterally free slaves that came to Mount Vernon from his wife's estate. His actions were influenced by his close relationship with the Marquis de Lafayette. Martha Washington would free slaves to which she had title later in her own life. He didn't speak out publicly against slavery, argues historian Dorothy Tuhig, because he didn't wish to risk splitting apart the young republic over what was already a sensitive and divisive issue. Religious Beliefs Washington was baptized into the Church of England. In 1765, when the Church of England was still the state religion, he served on the vestry, lay council, for his local church. Throughout his life, he spoke of the value of righteousness and of seeking and offering thanks for the blessings of heaven. In a letter to George Mason in 1785, Washington wrote that he was not among those alarmed by a bill making people pay towards the support of that religion which they profess, but felt that it was impolitic to pass such a measure, and wished it had never been proposed, believing that it would disturb public tranquility. His adopted daughter, Nellie Custis Lewis, stated, I've heard her, Nellie's mother, Eleanor Calvert Custis, who resided in Mount Vernon for two years, say that General Washington always received the sacrament with my grandmother, Martha Washington, before the Revolution. After the Revolution, Washington frequently accompanied his wife to church services. However, there's no record of his ever taking communion, and he would regularly leave services before communion with the other non-communicants, as was custom of the day, until he ceased attending at all on Communion Sundays. Prior to Communion, believers are admonished to take stock of their spiritual lives and not to participate in the ceremony unless he finds himself in the will of God. Historians and biographers continue to debate the degree to which he can be counted as a Christian and the degree to which he was a deist. He was an early supporter of religious toleration and freedom of religion. In 1775, he ordered that his troops not show anti-Catholic sentiments by burning the Pope in effigy on Guy Fawkes' night. When hiring workmen for Mount Vernon, he wrote to his agent, If they be good workmen, they may be from Asia, Africa, or Europe. They may be Mohammedans, Jews, or Christians of any sect, or they may be atheists. In 1790, he wrote a response to a letter from the Toro Synagogue, in which he said that as long as people remain good citizens, their faith does not matter. This was a relief to the Jewish community of the United States, since the Jews had been either expelled from or prejudiced against in many European countries. Personal Life in addition to Martha's biological family noted above, George Washington had a close relationship with his nephew and heir, Bushrod Washington, son of George's younger brother, John Augustine Washington, who became an associate justice on the Supreme Court after George's death. As a young man, Washington had red hair. A popular myth is that he wore a wig, as was the fashion among some at the time. Washington did not wear a wig. Instead, he powdered his hair, as represented in several portraits, including the well-known unfinished Gilbert Stuart depiction. Washington suffered from problems with his teeth throughout his life. He lost his first tooth when he was 22, and had only one left by the time he became president. According to John Adams, he lost them because he used them to crack Brazil nuts, although modern historians suggest it was probably the mercury oxide he was given to treat illnesses such as smallpox and malaria. He had several sets of false teeth made, four of them by a dentist named John Greenwood. Contrary to popular belief, none of the sets were made from wood. 
The set made when he became president was carved from hippopotamus and elephant ivory, held together with gold springs. The hippo ivory was used for the plate, into which real human teeth and also bits of horses and donkeys' teeth were inserted. Dental problems left Washington in constant discomfort for which he took laudanum, and this distress may be apparent in many of the portraits painted while he was still in office, including the one still used on the one-dollar bill. One of the most enduring myths about George Washington involves him as a young boy chopping down his father's cherry tree, and when asked about it using the famous line, I cannot tell a lie, I did it with my little hatchet. In fact, there is no evidence that this ever occurred. It, along with the story of Washington's throwing a silver dollar across the Potomac River, was part of a book of stories authored by Mason Weems that made Washington somewhat of a legendary figure.